You need what, what we call a non-trivial minimal criterion to reproduce. In other words, the minimal criterion on Earth is you basically have to be a walking Xerox machine, like a copying machine. You have to have physically something inside of you, or somebody, if it's, if it's going to be sexual, has to have inside of them the ability to make another copy of a human being. And if you don't have that, then that's it. Um, and this is what we call a minimal criterion. So this is getting to a high level of abstraction, because the point is, the minimal criterion doesn't have to be that algorithmically. Like, the minimal criterion could be, you have to draw an accurate depiction of your grandmother. Now, of course, this wouldn't work in, in, in physical nature, but imagine that algorithmically, you know, somebody comes, God comes down and gives you an offspring if you draw an accurate depiction of your grandmother. Then you're, all, you're good to go. You still need to survive. But instead of survive and reproduce, survive and, and draw a picture of your grandmother. Now, I would submit to you that this can also generate a very interesting open-ended process. We would immediately see um, a vast divergence of ways of drawing your grandmother accurately. Um, all kinds of Rube Goldbergian techniques for doing this. And so this is an insight about like, how nature works. It's basically based on a minimal criterion, but the minimal criterion here on this planet is just one of an infinite number of conceivable minimal criteria. Number two, individuals have to create novel opportunities to satisfy this minimal criterion. So your existence is creating new ways for me to satisfy the criterion, so for example, by giving a speech. Um, and, and I also am creating opportunities for you, and all the organisms are creating opportunities for each other, and we've just discussed that, so that, that gets into the list. Number three, individuals must decide for themselves with what or whom to interact. This is a tricky one, but basically it's based on the insight that like, in some open-ended systems, there's an attempt to deterministically or even randomly decide where something will be placed and that will determine what the future experiences will be. Well, this clearly can't scale out because we have no idea where we should place things in order to have the interactions they need to have. In other words, like, the, the giraffe decided to go to the tree. Nobody could have predicted billions of years in the future when life first began that there would be trees and giraffes and the giraffe needs to be placed next to a tree. The giraffe has to be the one to make that decision because we can't project way into the future what the requirements are going to be and who should interact with whom. And so this condition goes into the list. And finally, the ability to increase the size of the representation so that we can have increasing information stored in the genome or in the representation if it's not evolutionary. Note that this doesn't necessarily say it has to be evolutionary. Um, this is like neat. Uh, this is, I think this is a clear one. It's not so controversial. At some point, you're going to run out of space. You need more space in the representation if you're going to keep going forever. So those are just some proposed conditions. And like I said, again, I, I'm not necessarily claiming that these are uh, correct or sufficient. Um, but it's an attempt, let's at least take, take a stab at the problem. And then that led to Chromaria. So Lisa and I then worked together to try to create a world that satisfies these conditions so that we could then do experiments. So I went, went back to ALF worlds. As I said, I'm ultimately not motivated by trying to create a world, but I see a world as a tool or a lens for trying to investigate um, the viability of different conditions and trying to understand what can lead to this kind of process. So to satisfy these conditions, this is a world where creatures have to plant on top of each other by color matching. So the minimal criterion here is you have to find a place where the colors match up with you and then, just, and then say, I want to plant there. And if you do, you'll be allowed to reproduce. And so we have the, everything satisfied. Like These guys are creating opportunities for each other. Because like when I plant, I put my colors on the ground, and now someone else could plant on top of me and so forth. So it's a very simple system, very visual, that allows us to kind of get towards these um, these, these conditions. And the, um, and the point of the system is we can control for the conditions, so I can actually make it so that some conditions are not holding. I was going to show you this in the video, but I think I'm going to have the same bad problem here. So I'm just, that's a picture of the world in static. If it was actually happening, you'd see these guys like moving around trying to find somewhere to plant, and the smart guys would plant uh, on someone who looks like them. And so they have neural networks and vision and so forth. So we would do things like we would control uh, control for um, like uh, uh, taking out a condition, like making it no longer hold, and then see how degenerate the world would become. So, like on these bottom panels, you're, the, the details don't matter here, but you're seeing degenerate chromaria worlds where it does, fails to develop uh, because uh, we took out a condition. So, at least we could validate some of our hypotheses in this particular context and give us some confidence in the conditions that we were proposing. Now then, and, and this is sort of, I think, is how research might progress, is that we then took the conditions out of Chromaria, because now we're saying, okay, we have some confidence in our conditions. So and I did this work with uh, student Jonathan Brandt. Um, and we said, okay, let, let's actually try to take these, these conditions and actually implement them in an algorithm that isn't rounded in a world, because it's nice to not be stuck in a world. 
Um, and so we call this minimal criterion co-evolution. And the idea is that we have the idea of a minimal criterion and self-generating opportunities, but we're going to leverage co-evolution, a two-population kind of a co-evolution, so that this is a domain general algorithm, so it's not tied to a particular world or domain. And so this is an attempt to, to sort of make the statement that we can actually conceive of abstract open-ended algorithms that are not tied to like Earth simulations. And so uh, the first test that we had was uh, mazes and maze solvers. So the problems are mazes, the solutions are maze solvers. And what was kind of fun about this is we, we evolved in this uh, minimal criterion co-evolution system, um, this, uh, a situation where the mazes could get bigger indefinitely and so could the maze solvers. And we, we seem to see this kind of um, ratcheting effect happen where things would get larger and larger and the solutions would get more and more complex. Um, and what's interesting about this system, I think, is that at least it might be worth coming back in a billion years. I mean, if we had the computation and the storage, because maybe these mazes would be the size of the, of the galaxy by then, and you'd actually have neural networks solving them based on this algorithm. Now, again, I'm not saying we should celebrate anything, because like, there's a lot of criticisms, and some people here have had long discussions with about like, what the possible objections are to declaring victory at this point, and I agree. Let's not declare victory prematurely. Um, but all this is is just something I hope that provokes thinking. Um, you can see that we can take some steps in the direction. I mean, one objection is, but still just mazes. Like, I mean, is it really that interesting if I just have more and more complex mazes forever? Um, but at least it's a step in a direction of understanding. So, clearly, we're not finished. Um, the field is just beginning, and uh, chal many challenges uh, remain. So, like, for example, generating endless high-quality diverse and interesting artifacts remains a big challenge. How do we ensure that things are really interesting? What is the killer application that is a huge problem for us? Like in terms of getting attention and mind share, we have to be able to articulate what this is going to be used for. I have a very strong sense, as I think a lot of people here do, that there is going to be some amazing applications, but what are they? We need to think of them. Um, the measurement of success remains uh, controversial and open. There have been some seminal steps like Mark Bidow and, and some of his colleagues developed what are called activity statistics, which are measures of sort of open-ended activity. Um, and this was, uh, I think, uh, an important step in terms of understanding what we might do to measure what it's like to get open-endedness. I also enjoyed uh, and actually appreciated a lot this, this paper by Dalton and her colleagues from 2015, which was a reflection, in my view, on some of some of the issues that open-endedness is not. Because it turns out really hard to say what it is, but at least maybe through a process of elimination we can get closer. So I thought that was nice. However, I want to, this is the last kind of thing I want to make a point on. I want to be really cautious about getting too bogged down in definitions. Like a definition is not the same as a victory. Let's not stumble simply because defining success is difficult. You know, it, it's dangerous to, to quibble about definitions. Because like, if we do uh, converge on a definition, we risk celebrating prematurely, and this would be very bad for the progress of the field. We don't want to declare victory now, because I happen to come up with a definition that says, for example, chromaria is open-ended. Well, it's all over then. Where is the measure metric for progress now? That's dangerous. Um, and furthermore, like, look at the field of AI. They don't need to have a consensus on the definition of intelligence to make progress towards intelligence. There still remains no consensus on what the heck is intelligence. The field is doing perfectly fine. We can do the same thing. So let's not get too bogged down on this question. I think there's a tendency as a new field to start torturing each other about stuff like this. Because we want to be very objective and act scientific, right? It's like we're really being serious about this. Um, but then, you know, we start to actually attack each other and basically cannibalize the whole field. So let's be careful and be open-minded. In fact, I'm worried that maybe open-endedness is partially subjective because ultimately it has something to do with interestingness. And what's interesting to me is a partially a subjective matter. And so it may be that there is no absolute definition that will always satisfy all of us in every case. And that's okay because still we can inject our notion of interestingness into any particular instance of an algorithm. So that may be our solution is that we need to guide these algorithms to move along paths that we deem interesting without necessarily worrying about whether it's open-endedness in an absolute sense. So I just want to keep us open-minded and less strict with each other about the definitional issues um, in order to get the field like, kind of moving really fast. We can still set milestones, even without that over overarching consensus. So uh, I, I wrote this article with several colleagues in 2017 because I started to feel like there's not enough attention on this thing. I still can't really understand why this isn't like everybody wants to think about this. It's just such a cool problem. Um, so we wrote this article sort of from a non-technical perspective 
It's called open-endedness, the last grand challenge you've never heard of. So that like you can introduce people from outside the field, including like way outside the field. Like we don't know what kind of people might be able to contribute. I mean, it could be artists, it could be biologists, it could be economists, sociologists. Who knows? Like everything sort of enters into us because this is, like I said, the power of creation. And so I want everyone to be able to have access to this problem so we can actually discuss it. So he wrote this article. I'm showing it to you in the link there, but it's easy to find on Google or something like that. So you could also share it if you want to tell somebody about open endedness. You could say, well, here's something you could read. This is an easy read. It is a long read, because I wanted it to be a real substantive introduction. Um, but it's there and it's available. You also can get more thoughts than I could give you in, in the 50 minutes um, on, uh, on divergent search from our book. Um, this is from myself and Joe Lehman, of Why Greatness Cannot Be Planned. This is a lot of ruminations on why objective-driven searches are ultimately very limited, not just algorithmically, but also in society, where notice, we also tend to drive many, many endeavors through objectives. And this is a mistake if we're trying to actually get to innovative processes, which I hope that you get some sense of from what I've told you today. So here's some links, I'm, and I lastly just want to say that, um, like, I, I could be opening myself up to, to problems if I get tons of emails, but for this particular topic, I'm really happy to take anyone's email at all. So please feel free to contact me, send me thoughts or anything, because I just want to support um, the growth of this field, um, or even tweet me, um, if you'd like, or tweet something. Um, and, uh, and I'd be more than happy to, to talk to people more uh, about this topic. So. Please attend the workshop tomorrow. I'm actually, I'm not an organizer of the workshop, but I'm promoting it because it's a really great topic. Um, and uh, and, and uh, happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for a wonderful talk. Uh, so now we will talk about you and a time. Before that, uh, can I ask the three presenters in the lightning talk to prepare for the real presentation? Could you come to the stage for preparing the talk? Thank you very much. And then, yes, the jury can go. And the slide. There's some questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this should be. Oh, oh, I see slide was coming. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. okay. Sorry. Is <laughs> good. Could you show the slide? certainly is up for debate, but I mean, we're not necessarily debating how it works in nature, because what we actually care, I think, at least what I care about, is just any algorithm that could work, so it doesn't have to be nature, but looking to nature can be inspiration for making the best algorithm, and indeed, the more kind of self-organized aspect of nature um, could be inspiration, uh, that could lead to progress, so I want to admit that as, as something that we should consider, but not necessarily say it is the missing ingredient, or, or even, hey, I'm not totally sure. Um, and like I said, I think there's at least more than that. So I think that, like for example, that's not going to solve the creating opportunities problem. 
This is a separate issue. But this is an issue that's worth looking at. And I have to really take it seriously since this is the most upvoted question. So there must, must be a lot of people like self-organization here. Um, so certainly, um, that's fun to think about and, and an important point. Um, I push back a little bit on the creating new opportunities thing because I think in nature that is one of the really powerful things that creates new opportunities. When a niche gets filled, it opens new ones. Um, we can talk about this more later, too. Great, yeah. That's also interesting. Okay, thank you very much. So the next one is by Charles Kujas. Sure, so uh, you were talking about how um, uh, when, when you talk about novelty search, um, you're looking for new things, and that there's not an explicit fitness function mm -hmm. you're focusing on new. And, that, mm -hmm. and I, I think that's a fantastic way uh, to look at it. However, um, you have to have some way of deciding what is novel and what is not. You don't want every single mutation to, oh, well, there's a change in the genome, there's a change in something um, to be considered novel, or else you'll just have a complete explosion of, of novelty. So it seems like when we make that decision about what we want to call novel, we focus on what's interesting to us. And as such, interestingness to the designer, or in the case of pick breeder, the set of, mm -hmm. of humans that are involved in the system mm -hmm. is what is creating the fitness function of functions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think there's a couple layers to that question. Um, there's a layer at which we just could talk about whether uh, novelty is a fitness function or there's a hidden fitness function, which I think is a somewhat, could be a semantic argument at some level, like whether we should call it fitness. But there's a more interesting layer to the argument um, which has to do with where the idea of what's interesting is being injected into the process. And definitely there's a back door for that there. I mean, it's, the human is making a very important decision when the human decides what it means to be novel. And I didn't go into those details, of course, but in novel research there is something called a behavior characterization, which is how we characterize what happened in order to compare it to other things and then say it's novel. So by designing the behavior characterization, you are implicitly um, hinting at what's interesting. And that's very much true. And, but I think that yeah, is a good thing. You know, if you go to like the, my last couple slides, where I was talking about like what it means to make progress and how difficult it is. Um, it is what I think ultimately we're going to have to do is inject the notion of interestingness. Because if we don't, we're going to get very abstract things like random numbers and be arguing about whether there's like this hidden meaning in this code. And I'd rather not be doing that. I think that what we what we do want is to be able to have a notion of the kinds of distinctions that matter to us, and then let it like basically feed on that distinction. And so um, the, the interestingness uh, that's being injected there, um, I think is very important, but the one caveat I would say is that uh, it is, there are some people who are looking for generic behavior characterizations. You can think of things like the outputs of a neural network as generic, like, but I don't think they're very good right now. Because like, like if I said that my behavior is whatever I output, well I could be standing in front of a wall and saying move forward, but I'm actually not moving forward. So it's not a very good actually uh, representation of what's actually happening in the world. And what's actually happening is what I think I care about in terms of what's interesting. So it's very difficult to formulate generic characterizations. They tend to be domain specific, and yet humans then are involved. And you could call it cheating, but I think it's a good thing. I think we want humans to be able to tell the algorithms what's interesting, and then just riff on that forever. Now, I don't think it's cheating at all. I was mostly disagreeing oh. with the idea that there's no fitness function. Oh. I think you are. Uh, doing a great job by putting in a fitness function mm -hmm. that focuses on the yeah. ultimate goal of you want to come back in four billion years okay. and to be interesting, well, let's make it interesting. Well, okay, goal. I see. Let me respond to that just for a second. I, I don't like calling it a fitness function, which you know, I guess, but I don't like calling it a fitness function because it's just not compatible with the way that we usually talk about fitness in evolutionary computation. And I'm trying to draw a distinction, so I just think in terms of vocabulary, um, it's not the best use of vocabulary to conflate things that I want to separate. And so, like, with fitness, we're usually saying that it's aligned with exactly some kind of point, which I'm trying to get to. Like, that's the objective, that's the notion of an objective. And fitness rewards you as you move closer to that objective, or it's multi-objective, it's multiple points. There's not what's going on in these algorithms. There's not a point, or set of points. Um, and it's actually about the vector that you're moving at any given time is basically defined by your notion of what's interesting. How should I move in general, not where should I get to? And so I prefer not to call it fitness for that reason, just because I want to draw a distinction, but I realize it's like drawn in a lot of controversy because people just want to say, well, that is fitness. It's just a different kind of fitness. And so that's where I think we might get into semantics. Thank you very much. Uh, the last question will be uh, Takasan. Hi, Ken, it was a great talk. Um, my question is, uh, in this 20th century and 21st century, we have a 
bunch of interesting discoveries in mathematics and physics, like Higgs, Higgs was on them and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so it looks like you know it's the emergence open-endedness is getting faster and faster. But on the other hand, if we try to uh, simulate computation relation of ecological systems, uh, it <coughs> tend to have, you know, uh, for example, like Ionka Taylor equations, uh, logarithmically slowing down the new, new uh, properties to come out. For example, like the Carsten Linglin's uh, IPD game is also a uh, new property is emerging in logarithmic time scale. So it's getting slower and slower. So I just want to know uh, the opinion uh, whether mm -hmm. the new you know, open-endedness is getting accelerated or mm -hmm. being uh, slowing down. Yeah, so um, I think that's a very complicated problem, like whether any given open-ended process is, is accelerating or slowing. And probably it can go through. Oops. Okay, I'm confusing myself there. Um, so open-endedness, uh, so these systems probably go through oscillating cycles of ups and downs. Whether any given system is going through uh, one of those um, oscillations, um, I think that, that for me is very hard to, to talk like, is nature slowing down? Um, what does that even mean exactly? I think some pockets are slowing and some aren't. Like there are some rules of thumb, for example, I think that when there's extreme high pressure, then you will get actually slowdowns, not speed-ups. Um, because you can't experiment when you're under high pressure. You know, like if I said, like, you know, you're going to die tomorrow unless you do this, you're not going to go be like, well, I have a computer experiment I need to run. I'm going to go actually do what I told you to, you're going to do what I told you to do. Um, and so highly competitive niches, I think, actually may be less innovative. Now, like, less competitive situations like hospitals, hospitals mean that people who otherwise would have died don't. Now those people can reproduce. Now we actually get more of a divergence on that tree of possibilities. They actually, I would think, accelerate innovation in some sense. So I think you could argue that human, the human species, is accelerating in some way, probably, predictably, um, because the pressure has gone down in some way. I personally had appendicitis before I had a kid, and I would be dead. Uh, but I'm not, thanks to the hospital, so we get to see what kind of path that I might lead to. Um, and so um, it really depends on very specific local issues that are going on in the process. Now, in a larger algorithmic sense, obviously we don't want deceleration. I think, like, if we're going to build an algorithm, that this is different than just observing an existing system. Um, then we might argue, well, what do we need to do to actually facilitate acceleration, or at least not deceleration? Then I think we need observations like that. Like, we need to balance the amount of pressure because we understand that as pressure goes up, which may be intrinsic to the system, so difficult for us to control, but we may want to have some levers that can allow us to get in there and, and, and somehow change those things that we have some belief or, or even proof um, has an influence on the rate of the, the process. Um, so it's a very complicated issue, um, but I think we can start to get grasp and, and talk about it at least and think about it and it's important. Thanks so much. Okay, thank you very much for a wonderful talk. Thank you very much again. So, uh, so let's go on to the lightning talk session. Uh, we have the three uh, three talks, and uh, each has seven minutes and talk and three minutes for questions.
like to remind everyone that if you are presenting a poster, first, uh, thank you for uh, putting it on the board. Uh, in front of the coffee area, there, there are rooms called Jupiter and Saturn. That's where you want to go and stick your poster on one of those boards. Um, with your poster comes a number, and that number uh, is the number in which you are going to line up later at 11 o'clock. Uh, in order to give a one minute, uh, very short, uh, poster pitch. So uh, we'll ask you right before 11 to, to line up and uh, this will be a very fun, very quick experience. Thank you. Thank you. 